The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. That'll make, uh, that'll make some sense to you. We've got uh, a great registration numbers for this topic, uh, understanding basic antenna, Wi-Fi antenna concepts. I'm uh, really excited to get this going. We're, we're going to get started in about two or three minutes here. We've got uh, 10.58 here local time in Cleveland. Uh, I am logging in from uh, my home office, as you can see, and Mike Graham is with me today, and he's in Charlotte, North Carolina. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Don. <laughs> so, uh, as always, I'd love to start this off by uh, you guys telling us where you're dialing in from today. Um, <laughs> it's funny, uh, 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 Olivia, you have always come in first in Vancouver. I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, every week, I love it. Um, so keep those co dialing in. Um, use the chat room. Let us know where you're, you're logging in from. We appreciate it. Uh, I assume many of us are uh, logging in from the home office, though. Probably not all of us. Uh, I know that there are quite a few essential workers on the line that that join us every week, uh, and they're in either in healthcare or in distribution or or um, some other areas, some other industries. Uh, and we appreciate the hard work that you guys are putting in. Uh, so I got uh, Tin Buck Two in here. You certainly get the furthest away. I know that's sarcasm. We've got uh, another Charlotte here. So one of your neighbors is also logged in, Mike. Uh, logging in from home. Thanks, Ron. Uh, UK, Red Hill. Um, thanks uh, for logging in from the UK. I know sometimes it's difficult to, to with the time change to get in here. Uh, Orlando, Pennsylvania. Uh, Near and dear to my heart, I am from Pennsylvania as well, the Philadelphia area, Iowa, Boston. Thanks for everybody logging in and, and telling us where you're dialing in from. Keep those coming. California, Mexico. Um, we got Moscow on the line. Thanks for uh, for letting us know that as well. We've got those those areas in particular. We've got great distribution partners in, in the UK with Open Reality and Russia with CompTech and in Mexico with Sama. So I appreciate uh, the new activity of folks coming in. Um, so we've got uh, 11 o'clock here, local time. We're going to go ahead and get going. So I mentioned earlier that uh, we've got a great new webinar with, for you guys today. It's Understanding Basic Wi-Fi Antenna Concepts. Um, and this is a, 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 a topic that's near and dear to Mike Graham's heart, who's, who's with us today. And actually, this is the most popular white paper that 7Signal has as well. Um, so everyone who's joining us today is going to get a copy of that white paper um, it, on the same uh, title. And uh, so I'm excited to share that with you all today. So just a quick, uh, couple quick updates um, to get us going. Um, we're not going to get into any product today. Um, sometimes we dovetail and, and do show some product uh, features and functions just because it's relevant to the topic. Uh, but this is purely um, antenna concepts today. So we're not going to talk product. If you do want product information, if you came here for that, um, uh, stick with us anyway. We've got some great content for you. And if you do want a product tour, we have them every Friday at noon Eastern. You can go to go.7signal.com and uh, register for that uh, product tour. Uh, no sales pitches or anything, just pure product. Um, so we will share a copy of today's recording as we always do. And we do post all of our archived webinars on YouTube. So you can go there uh, and get access to any of our different topics. Lots of 101 basic um, uh, Wi-Fi concept type webinars and then uh, some product things. We've got customer highlights, all kinds of fun stuff. I'm going to talk about special offers in a second, but I've got some really cool announcements. Um, we've got uh, four new uh, Seven Signal certified wireless engineers, and I want to congratulate them before we get started today. So congratulations to Manish and Rocky and Victor and, and Rutgar. Um, thank you very much for taking those uh, engineering classes and becoming more efficient with Seven Signal products. Um, if you have, if if you would like more information on that, you can go to our website uh, and click on certifications and get access to those training courses as well. So, congratulations, guys, uh, and thank you uh, for taking those training courses. Really, two quick uh, promotions, and I'll get into the to the slide deck. Um, for those of you who would like to try our mobile eye for free to help support your remote workers, we are giving away uh, free. Uh, 50 mobile eye licenses for 50 days to help you out during the the uh, 
COVID-19 crisis. And for our customers, uh, we have a thousand for 60 days. Um, so uh, it's our way of giving back. And we've had some really great uptick. Uh, I was on a call yesterday and we're up to over 50,000 uh, licenses that we've given away during this time. So please take us up on the offer, go.7signal.com forward slash 50 for 50 or 1000 for 60 if you are a customer. So uh, a little bit about 7signal before I hand the controls over to Mike Graham and talk about uh, Wi-Fi antenna concepts. 7signal has been around since 2007 and we've hit uh, some really, really major milestones along the way. Um, since that time, uh, since our founding in Helsinki in 2007. Um, we're up to a billion data points that we crunch on a daily basis. So we're monitoring a lot of devices and a lot of uh, networks for our customers. And we use that data to help them see trends and be proactive with their wireless um, endpoints and also their networks. So we're doing a lot of troubleshooting, a lot of help that they're all able to get access to through their online dashboards. We've got over 200 customers around the world and over 30 partners. Uh, and the technology that you see from 7Signal, you're only going to see from 7Signal. We've got 14 patents, uh, monitor over 5 million uh, devices on a daily basis. Uh, so lots of endpoints out there. We see a lot of things. We, we correlate a lot of data and, and know what adapters and drivers work and, and just so much more. Uh, our products are certified in over 40 countries around the world. We are GDPR compliant. So not only do we stay up to date with our technology stack, but privacy is also near and dear to our hearts. Um, and we want to make our customers rest assured that um, they are their data is safe with us. So in a nutshell, 7Signal is here to enable the wireless world. And how we do that, uh, or what we do, excuse me, is we help them find and fix Wi-Fi issues proactively. So since 2007, we've created uh, the only outside-in enterprise framework in the industry, all completely AP and device agnostic, completely modular. So depending on the challenges that you face within your industry, within your organization, uh, we can position the right, uh, uh, the right products and services uh, to help you meet those challenges. All of our products are replete with reports and analytics and alerts. Um, and we're not gonna get into too much product stuff today, if any. Um, but what we're doing is we're looking for the top seven Wi-Fi challenges. So whether or not the problem presents itself as uh, slow or the end user is unable to connect, everything bubbles up to one of these seven problems that we fix. Um, congestion, coverage, co-channel and radio interference, network services, roaming, adapters and drivers and wireless LAN configuration. And how we're doing it is we are running active and passive tests on the devices and on the network for things like throughput, packet loss, latency and jitter, MOS scores, et cetera, uh, giving a full spectrum analysis with packet capture. Um, the only solution on the market uh, from 7Signal, the only vendor that can offer these sorts of monitoring capabilities. Uh, and I mentioned outside in, excuse me, um, it's important to know the difference uh, between what we call legacy, which is what uh, our uh, prospective customers have now. So they're relying on the access points or the devices to give them information or diagnostics about the end user experience. And they give great information and we're here to complement those devices. We're certainly not here to compete. But what they're missing is they're missing valuable end user information. Um, they're not able to look at uh, uh, home networks like we are, especially in times like this is where it's really, really important. So uh, we are here to complement those because we live on the edge or the outside in, as I mentioned. So on those devices, on the network, looking for um, things in the air, on the devices themselves, um, allowing our uh, engineers to get to the root cause of the problems very, very quickly. And we do that with two modules. Uh, on the left, you'll see Mobileye. That's our complete uh, SaaS application uh, or agent that lives on the device itself. Any Windows, Mac, or Android device, completely 100% software based. And it's looking for these five problems, adapters and drivers, roaming, adjacent and co-channel interference, coverage, and congestion. Whereas Sapphire Eye is our software-enabled hardware that is a sensor 
or a perfect client that lives up in the up in the rafters with the access points or down on a table or installed on a wall wherever it is installed and gives you a full spectrum analysis with packet capture and it looks for different problems so that's network services and wireless LAN configuration radio and co-channel interference coverage and congestion again we're the only vendor in the in the space to offer this complete suite uh, and because our products are patented you're not going to see this technology from anyone else so um, let's get on with the show shall we Mike um, I'm going to hand the controls over to you uh -huh. and yeah let's do this so uh, before we get started why don't uh, you tell us a little bit about yourself and and why these folks should listen sure um well, as the slide says, I, uh, I've been an SE with 7Signal for uh, about six years. Um, before that, I uh, have been designing, installing, troubleshooting wireless LANs since oh, 1993 or 1994. Um, and back then, that was uh, before Wi-Fi. So uh, we started out you know, five watts of UHF and handheld had miles and miles of range, <laughs> but they were slow uh, and the size, shape, and weight of a brick, so we've come a long way. Uh, and I've worked uh, for manufacturers, for uh, for distributors, uh, for retailers, uh, worked in the uh, federal and state government sectors, worked in the private sector. Uh, so I've uh, I've seen the, the wireless LAN business really just about since uh, since the beginning and uh, from a lot of different aspects. You've seen it all. We're, we're lucky to have you here at 7 Signal, Mike. So let's get into, let's dive into our, uh, our webinar today, shall we? Uh, antennas, let's start with Antennas 101. All right. Um, Don asked me to, uh, to put together a few slides, talk about uh, antennas. And, you know, obviously we're not going to, going to go too deep into the subject. That's uh, really the territory for entire textbooks. Uh, but I did want to talk about them uh, a little bit and explain to the abilities that I have uh, how they work. Um, and, uh, you know, first I thought that I would look up a, a good definition. Since that's always a, a good place to start. And I stole both uh, both this and the uh, the kind of cool animation that I hope everybody can see uh, on the right from uh, Wikipedia. Um, and really, an antenna it's the interface between radio waves that propagate through space and electrical currents that are moving uh, in conductors in wires and cables. Um, and we can see over on the the right a uh, diagram of an antenna, um, a dipole type antenna, it has two poles and you can see uh, there there's a top and a bottom part uh, and all uh, really we're doing for an antenna is we're applying an alternating current for Wi-Fi it's uh, very rapidly alternating you know 2.4 or uh, 5 uh, gigahertz uh, that billion times a second uh, and whenever you apply that alternating current to conductors that are uh, for example half a wavelength long as this dipole antenna is they shed that energy that you're applying to them as radio waves and those radio waves propagate away from the antenna uh, very much as the, the diagram shows uh, and on the receive side, really, the exact opposite is happening. As these electromagnetic waves pass by the antenna, they induce a current in the antenna. Uh, it travels down the transmission cable to the radio where it's amplified and received. So uh, a transmitting antenna and a receiving antenna, they are the same thing. They are coupling uh, those electromagnetic waves passing through space into an alternating current uh, and a wire. And that's, uh, at its heart, all an antenna is. It's a passive device. All it can do is is change uh, energy in a wire into energy in the air. Um, and if we go to the next slide, Don. Yeah, that uh, slide has got kind of a hypnotizing effect. I, I hope I never <laughs> see that graphic again. <laughs> I love that graphic. I saw that. I'm like, I've got to put that in the presentation. Um, 
you know, and there's there's obviously a lot of uh, a lot of vocabulary around antennas, and uh, I think we're out of scope for this presentation to cover it all. But there was a, a couple that I wanted to put in uh, and touch on as, as part of the basic. And the first of those is gain. You know, you know it's the the first thing that uh, an antenna spec will have is what's the gain, uh, and, and you know what is what is gain, and it's simply a measure of an antenna's ability to direct energy in a particular direction. Uh, we talk about gain relative to an isotropic antenna. An isotropic antenna is just an antenna that radiates equally in all directions. Um, you know, think of a conventional light bulb. Uh, uh, you know, other than immediately below it where it's connected, uh, it largely illuminates uh, every direction equally. Um, and then gain measures how much we focus that energy in a particular direction. And it's measured relative to that isotropic antenna, uh, dBi, decibels, uh, relative to isotropic. And we've got a, uh, a little diagram in here uh, that shows, um, say, the radiation pattern, the energy pattern for an isotropic antenna uh, viewed in one plane. It's circular in all directions. And then we'll see a game antenna, an antenna uh, that focuses energy. Um, and if we were to add up these two circles, um, the actual area is the same. The amount of energy is the same. We're just taking energy from one direction and adding it into another direction. Uh, below that, we've got uh, an analogy that uh, that I use a lot, uh, which is the balloon analogy. Uh, you've got a balloon, it's got a certain amount of air in it, and you can squeeze it into different shapes, but the total amount of air, energy, the amount of energy remains the same. So it's important to remember an antenna doesn't create power, it just focuses it. If we're going to send power one direction, we're not sending it in another. Um, and then the second one is, is one that doesn't get talked about a lot, but I hear it on on a call uh, that I'm on a lot, uh, and that is transmit versus receive antennas. Um, and you'll hear, oh, we've got a really big antenna on one side so the client can hear us, but we can't hear the client, or we can't you know, hear the client, but it can hear us. Or, and that's really not the way antennas work. There's some kind of principle of reciprocity that states that the transmitting and receiving properties of the antenna are identical. So if an antenna focuses its transmission energy in one direction or one plane, it's going to receive better in that same direction or that same plane. And the amount of gain, the amount of, of focus is going to be the same. Uh, so an antenna that um, you know has a certain amount of, of gain in one direction to transmit is going to hear just as well in that direction. So you don't have to worry about what sometimes they call the alligator effect, big mouth and and uh, tiny ears with an antenna. Uh, that just isn't the way they work. They, uh, they make your mouth and your ears uh, not bigger, but more focused. Um, talk a little bit about types of antennas, and this isn't a, a really strict classification. It's um, more functional, but let's start with omnidirectional antennas. They're, they're kind of the most common. I'm going to start with what I'm calling stick antennas. They're uh, the, the most common antennas that you're, you're probably familiar with. They, uh, they're really a piece of wire, or a, a long piece of wire in some cases. Um, and they're sometimes called dipoles or rubber ducts for the small ones. Or the whip, maybe especially for uh, mobile antennas, get called whips a lot. Um, collinear, really it's a stack of dipoles uh, that focus uh, their energy uh, over and over again for each iteration and give you higher gain uh, perpendicular to that antenna. Um, uh, and then quarter wave, it's another uh, 
really it's half of a dipole, basically. Uh, and these antennas can have quite high gain. Uh, they range anywhere from really 2.2 uh, DBI for a dipole uh, up to about 15 for for really big stick antennas. Um, over to the right, I have the uh, first of our polar plots for antenna coverage. On the uh, left side of both of these is a view looking straight down uh, from the top of the antenna, so uh, above your screen looking down at it. And it shows the radiation pattern to the sides. So we see that it's approximately circular, omnidirectional antenna. It covers equally well in all directions. The, the plots on the right are looking at the antenna from the side. So we'll see the uh, upper antenna, the smaller one, has a donut shape. Uh, so it, it radiates more to the sides and less from the top and bottom. So there's that balloon effect. We're squeezing in on the top and the bottom of that bubble, and it's bulging out to the sides. Better coverage out to the sides at the expense of coverage immediately above and below the antenna. Uh, below it, we'll see the coverage pattern for a larger antenna. Um, and you'll notice the pattern is much skinnier top to bottom and a little bit more jagged and, and bulgy. But what we're doing is we're we're stacking up those dipoles, and it's squeezing uh, that balloon harder and harder uh, into a thinner and thinner plane uh, and reaching out uh, farther to the sides. But once again, at the expense of anything above or below that antenna. Uh, and then just over to the, uh, to the right, uh, we've got kind of that classic donut that we see for the dipole. Uh, and then uh, somebody did a projection on the uh, the back two walls and the floor uh, to try to make it a little more clear what those diagrams mean uh, if it isn't apparent to you. The, the three-dimensional donut in the middle is that radiation pattern. Uh, and then on the back walls, you see the side view, looking at the side of the antenna. Uh, and then on the bottom, you see that circular uh, round view. Uh, so that's... That's really how those those diagrams are read, uh, and you'll see them all the time uh, for antennas. So I thought it uh, I thought that was a nice explanation or uh, explanatory uh, graphic there that sort of shows how you get those shapes. Mm -hmm. The other kind of omnidirectional antennas uh, that we see a lot are low profile. Uh, integrated into access points. Uh, I have there in the center a, a external version um, sold by a third party, uh, about an inch thick, you know, three or four inches around. Um, and then uh, down in the lower left corner, have an even smaller antenna, and that is approximately to scale with the uh, quarter behind it. Um, so you can see that is really a very, very small antenna. Um, and then to the right, uh, one of our other SEs, uh, Chris Minton, uh, disassembled an access point and took some pictures. I think this is actually an Aruba access point, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, and we can see those little silver paperclip looking things scattered around the board. Uh, are those low-profile antennas uh, very similar to the one behind the quarter? Um, so the the kind of question becomes, you know, why not always use these? Uh, they're prettier, obviously. You know, you don't have those big big pipes sticking down. But if you look at the uh, the pattern graph uh, up in the upper right corner there, uh, we no longer really have a nice donut. Uh, <laughs> You know, nor do we really have a, a really squished thin donut. We have a, a pattern that I sort of call the blob. Uh, you know, these these antennas uh, will will emit sort of a blob-shaped coverage right below them, um, and really that's that's great for uh, a lot of Wi-Fi applications. If it's carpeted areas and you're you're hanging one on the ceiling. Uh, really, that's what you're looking for is sort of a blob of coverage right below the antenna. 
Um, so that's that's what these uh, these give you. Uh, great for carpeted areas. Uh, you know, fine for for kind of up to medium density, but um, you know, definitely have a lot of limitations in the gain and the patterns that are available. Move on to directional antennas. Um, and these, instead of focusing energy down into that single plane, um, these will focus it in a, in a particular direction in uh, three dimensions. Uh, and you'll, you'll see these called patch or sometimes panel antennas. Yagi's, uh, which is that antenna in the bottom center, uh, is a Yagi. Um, we don't see a lot of those anymore because they're more expensive to make than the patch antennas. Uh, for similar performance. Um, we'll see a, a dish antenna, or really in this case it's a grid over on the left. Uh, those can have tremendous uh, gains. Uh, and then in the middle, a sector antenna that's uh, designed with a specific pattern uh, to cover a wide area horizontally in front of the antenna, but uh, it gets its gain from focusing up and down. And you can see out to the side of each of these, I have very typical patterns for them, uh, the, the patch antennas. And, and the patch antennas are great because by rearranging those little copper pads that you see uh, on that circuit board, you can, you can change what that pattern looks like uh, with great flexibility. Um, and then uh, below it, the sector antenna where you can see the vertical is quite narrow. Uh, horizontal is, is quite wide. I love these if I'm going to cover, say, a parking lot from, uh, from the side of a building. Uh, matter of fact, I did a little consulting, uh, freebie friend consulting for a friend of mine uh, whose company needed Wi-Fi coverage at a guard shack uh, out at the edge of their parking lot. They wanted to scan trucks as they came in and out as part of their new uh, you know, accounting system. And they had a quote that was way into five digits to trench up the parking lot and pull fiber and put an access point out in the in the uh, guard shack. And it would have worked fine, but it was trench up the parking lot and spend a lot of money. Um, so instead, we took a, a large sector, mounted them on the side of the building, um, and covered not only the parking lot and the, the guard shack, but we actually covered, like, all the way into the building across the street. So we might have overdone it a little bit. Uh, and then down at the bottom, uh, we have uh, uh, the pattern for these really high gain antennas, yagis and dishes uh, for the most part. And you'll see they're very tight pattern in, uh, in both vertical and horizontal plane. Uh, really, those are used for point to point links or for clients on point to multi-point links. We don't see them a lot in, in sort of pure uh, client servicing Wi-Fi. Um, we're mostly going to see those patch antennas uh, up on top because they are, they're so flexible and they're very, very uh, inexpensive to make. Uh, they really, it's a circuit board. They etch out the pattern onto it and uh, solder a connector onto one side and you're good to go. So they, uh, they can be mass produced very inexpensively. And they've largely reduced, uh, eliminated the, uh, the Yagi's uh, and the dishes for everything except the very highest game applications. Uh, and they work well. Uh, so those are, uh, those are my first group of antennas there. And then a little bit about uh, of the applications where you would use uh, each of these antennas. These very low gain, low profile integrated antennas, uh, as I said before, they're great for office areas, for carpeted spaces, uh, where you have low to medium density. Uh, so really think, you know, think office spaces. And they're attractive. Uh, you know, you don't have a big stick hanging down from your ceiling. Um, so, you know, nobody objects to having them there for the most part. Um, then move up to uh, the, an external antenna, and it's usually going to be a rubber duck, uh, 
uh, style, you know, small plastic antenna uh, that you'll see a lot on the, usually it's a dash E model for a lot of manufacturers access points, external uh, antennas that instead of having those integrated, they give you uh, antenna connectors on the outside. And those are, are great where you're not worried about the density and you want to get a little more coverage out of an access point. You know, lately everybody talks about high density uh, and of course in an office where everybody's got two or three devices and people are packed in tight, uh, density is important, but not every, not every application is dense. So, in, and particularly warehousing, manufacturing, uh, low density where you don't have a lot of clients and you'd like to get more coverage out of your access points, you use something with a little more gain than those integrated antennas, you get a little more coverage out of the access point. Um, I do want to stop and, and put in a caution in here, and it's actually in the in the PDF document of our antenna guide as well. Uh, but it's very easy uh, whenever you're using these gain antennas um, in a high ceiling room, uh, warehouses especially, manufacturing. If you mount those way up in the ceiling, uh, those antennas are focusing that energy out to the side, so all of the uh, all the energy stays up in the ceiling instead of uh, down where the clients are. So if you're going to use those gain antennas, you need to keep them fairly low. Uh, you know, don't mount them 30 feet above the floor. Find find some place lower uh, where you can take advantage of those without uh, without getting above uh, the antennas. And then the uh, the big high gain uh, external antennas, you know, 8, 10, 15 dBi. Uh, we don't use those a lot uh, in, in modern Wi-Fi. Um, sometimes we'll use them outdoors, very large spaces, low density. But with those, the problem uh, that I mentioned about putting the signal over people's heads uh, is even worse. Uh, those coverage patterns can be paper thin on those, and uh, used to see it all the time with with brand new uh, Wisps. Is they would, uh, you know, rent some space on a tower on a hill outside of town and put a monstrous omnidirectional antenna on it, and the system wouldn't work. Uh, you know, they couldn't shoot back to that antenna because all the signal was 100 feet over everybody's heads. Um, you know, mostly they've learned, uh, so we don't see that a lot anymore. But it is a cautionary point with those big high gain antennas: is the coverage patterns can be very narrow. Uh, that applies to directional antennas too. Um, and we uh, have a couple. You know, the the low to medium gain directional patches; uh, those are wonderful for. Uh, covering uh, high density spaces. If you have a lecture hall, uh, convention center, something like that, where you're really going to have more users on an access point than you want, um, or more interference between access points in a high density environment, uh, if you have those uh, those low gain blob <laughs> pattern antennas on them, you can use these patches, and you can. Uh, use it to focus energy straight down or, or at an angle onto a particular area. Area, And those antennas, since they are more focused, are going to spread less energy outside of their coverage zone or their intended coverage zone. And they're going to hear less interference as well. Because remember, transmit and receive properties are the same. Uh, and then finally, those big, uh, you know, 10 plus patch antennas. Um, once again, we don't use those a lot uh, in Wi-Fi, but in large venues, you can use them to spotlight an area that you can't otherwise get coverage into. And you know, if you can't can't put an access point somewhere, um, and you need to, to put signal in that spot, you can use them like a spotlight uh, and beam coverage right into there. Um, you know, we've uh, we've seen them used quite effectively in, in some sporting arenas where most of the area was covered with, uh, say, an AP under a seat, uh, but, you know, some of the bleachers were movable or chairs that they set out uh, that really you couldn't do a nearby access point. 
Uh, so they ended up just shining, shining high game patches down on them like spotlights, uh, and that uh, that can work very well for those those higher gain antennas. Um, so there's some of the applications for them. And uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a pivot here um, and talk about kind of home Wi-Fi uh, since we have so many people working from home and. We have a lot of challenges there that we don't have uh, in a corporate environment where you you do have control of the equipment, you do have control of the configuration. You have none of that for your home workers. You have, you know, consumer grade equipment. It's it's maybe what the ISP provided. Uh, of course, they're extremely driven by by price, so you don't necessarily get great quality equipment. Um, you don't generally have a SLA with your internet contract in a home environment, so uh, you know you've you've maybe got internet uh, problems. Um, I have no idea what I put connection there for. You don't have QoS on there, so you're generally not prioritizing voice and video traffic, uh, and it can be tough uh, to support those. Uh, so there are a few things that uh, that you can do to help. Uh, in the absence of having any control. Um, and one of the things you can do are, are try to fix some of this type of installation here. Um, I grabbed a few pictures of, uh, of uh, home access point installations. Uh, and the one in the upper left, if you uh, kind of look carefully, they've uh, hidden away their uh, router, modem router, uh, in their bookshelf, uh, and it's completely surrounded by big, thick books full of energy-absorbing paper. Uh, so, you know, they're they're probably wasting two-thirds of the output power uh, heating up those books. Uh, it isn't much, but uh, it's a little bit. And in the same way, uh, when on the receive side, uh, those radio waves have to pass through all that paper to get to the antenna and the router and be received. So not a great spot. Uh, to the right of that, uh, somebody's basement, you know, that's where the that's where the internet cable comes in. So that's where they put the router on the floor under the steps in the basement. Yeah, that's that's probably not gonna work great if you're in the second floor bedroom. It's an office. So uh, not the best choice either. Uh, and then on the bottom, uh, these were actually a couple of suggestions for what to do to hide your access point away. And they're, uh, they're definitely misfires. Uh, the one on the left, uh, they've put it in a box or in a drawer so they can put it in their desk and close it and hide it away. And you'll see the antennas are all folded down, lying next to each other, blocked and really just a terrible arrangement there. Uh, and then to the right of that, somebody has stuffed their access point in a, I think it's a magazine holder or, or something like that. You can see the cables wrapped around one of the antennas and um, you know, just not the way to go. Um, can you flip to the previous slide, Don? Sure. Now, here's one. It's actually in a pretty good position. You'll notice it's sitting out on an open dresser top. Uh, if you kind of look around in the background of the picture, it looks like it might be kind of in the center of the house. You know, it's it's not off in a corner somewhere far away from where you're trying to use it. Uh, so that's a, that's a much better place uh, to install a router uh, than the ones on the uh, the page of four on the next page. Mm -hmm. uh, bounce forward a couple. Um, so no uh, no pictures on this one, but just a few things that you can do uh, or maybe you can do to help improve home Wi-Fi. Um, you know, the first one is, is obvious. It's move the router closer to the client or the client closer to the router. Uh, remember that Signal strength falls off as the square of the distance. So if you're twice as far away, 
you get a quarter of the signal, and there's just no replacement for being closer. Uh, I know sometimes you know the router's where it is, and the office is where it is, and and you can't do anything about it. Uh, the second one is if you can't move it closer, then can you at least move it to improve the, the line of sight? Uh, Wi-Fi energy is going to be absorbed by walls, furniture, people, everything. Um, so the less of that you can have between you and your router, uh, the better off you are. Um, kitchens, bathrooms, utility rooms, those can be particularly bad. They're uh, you know, full of big metal appliances. Uh, sometimes bathrooms will have a, a big mirror in it. Uh, and of course, those have got a conductive silvered backing. So very hard to, to actually get signal through a big mirror. Um, sometimes if they're tiled, they'll have metal mesh behind the tile. Uh, so bathrooms can just be, just be deadly. Um, and if you can't, you know, move the router to a better position or move the, the client to a better position, then at least move the router so that it's not next to or under anything. Uh, antennas, particularly omnidirectional antennas, really perform best in open space. Uh, and I think, you know, underlined and bolded on that. Uh, I actually, uh, back in the day, did a lot of, uh, lot of testing uh, antennas at various distances from other objects. Um, and really, if you can get 18 inches of clear space around an antenna, then uh, it's going to perform much better than if you've got it stuck up against anything. Uh, and of course, definitely you don't want to stick it up against uh, anything uh, metal or uh, anything really absorptive like water or paper. Um, go off the slide a little bit here and talk uh, about some of the observations that we made when we started seeing our customers using mobile eye uh, in the home environment because uh, at, at first it was it was largely a corporate environment uh, and we would in fact uh, stop it from collecting data when the users weren't on their corporate network uh, but now that uh, more of our customers are using it at home. Uh, we're collecting data on home networks, and we expected to see a lot of interference problems, a lot of co-channel and adjacent channel interference from people's neighbors, um, and that isn't what we saw. Uh, what we saw is coverage issues. Uh, people at home, by and large, have got lousy, lousy signal, um, and. and you know, if you're running mobile eye, you'll be able to see that, see what the signal strength is on your clients. Um, if you're not moving, running mobile eye, and you're just shooting in the dark, uh, that's the first thing I would uh, look at for home users is, you know, is the router in clear space and is it close to the users? Um, that's going to be the, the best improvement you're likely to do for a home Wi-Fi network. Mm -hmm. uh, do I have any more slides, Doc? Nope, that is your last slide, and we dovetail into the Q&A. That's a good segue. And thanks, right. for the, thanks for the mobile eye plug there. That was, that was uh, <laughs> Well, uh, you know, it's, it's just about the only way to tell, uh, especially for the home users, where you have no visibility into the in infrastructure. Right, and it, it's such an inexpensive way to, to troubleshoot that. Um, you know, you don't, you don't have to ship any hardware around or do any, um, you know, walk through for someone's house with a, with a, an analyzer or, or any other tools. Um, so it's a, it's just a great way to, to get that done. So yeah. I'll, I'll dovetail in some Q and A here uh, while you guys are, and girls are chatting away your um, questions in the Q and A pane in go to webinar. A lot of other shout outs uh, came through. So I got to I got to mention Silver Springs, Maryland, Finland, Stockholm, Sweden, Michigan, Zurich. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for chatting in those guys. I had some questions about uh, recording of today's webinar and the white paper itself. So you will all receive a recording of this webinar um, and it will also be posted on YouTube. And in that email, you will also get uh, the white paper that refers to uh, best practices with antennas as well. 
So a um, couple questions here we've got in here and keep them coming. Uh, there's probably at least 10 here, um, uh, Mike, so I hope you're ready. So the first one here is who are some popular vendors for 3x3 or 4x4 MIMO dual band patch antennas and mounts? That's from Olivier. Um, you know, I used to buy a lot of antennas and I, I don't uh, anymore since I moved to, to 7 Signal and I don't do nearly as much hardware uh, as I used to. Uh, Laird, L-A-I-R-D. Uh, bought up Cushcraft not terribly long ago, uh, and they seem to have a pretty good selection. Um, you know, there's uh, TerraWave, which I believe is Tesco's in-house brand, and Tesco's a uh, a large radio products vendor or distributor, rather, uh, and they'll sell you really anything from a cover for your cell phone to a tower uh, so uh, you know you might take a look at uh, their web pages and, and see um, you know, I think Wincom is still selling a lot of antennas um, I wish I could give you a better answer but I just don't uh, I don't uh, really shop for antennas very much in the last few years Right on. Uh, next question from Damon. Uh, can you comment on wall versus ceiling mounting? Um, for, I guess it's for access points. Um, I think that m probably most of the access points, uh, the antennas are going to be designed uh, for ceiling mounting, or at least for horizontally mounting the antenna. Um, so if you're going to seal, if you're going to wall mount them vertically, uh, you know, do check the antenna patterns from the manufacturer and and see what that antenna pattern is. If it's a blob under the antenna, uh, it's probably going to be okay on the wall because then it'll be a, a blob in front of the antenna. Um, if it uh, is a little higher gain, um, especially if it has external antennas. Uh, the problem with wall mounting them, mounting them vertically, uh, is it's going to concentrate that uh, that signal along the plane of the wall instead of into the room. Um, and that's the case with, say, our sapphire eye is uh, the gain on it is very much uh, out to the side, so you don't want to mount that on the wall. Uh, vertically, we do have a, a wall mounting bracket that lets you mount it horizontally. So uh, uh, I would say, you know, check the pattern. Uh, in the access point documentation, uh, see see what that looks like before you decide to wall mount it. Um, but it, it can be okay. Uh, but most of them are designed to be mounted on the ceiling. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Alan is looking to give some channel recommendations for his home uh, his home employees. So it says, uh, what are some best channels, or what is the best channel to use? And uh, I guess this this question's got some layers to it, I suppose. Um, the best channel to use is one that nobody else is using. Right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> uh, some access points and routers will actually have a a function that will go in and tell you uh, who's on what channel. Um, the newest version of Mobileye we've added channel charts to it so it'll show you what channels are being occupied uh, and that's out I think the end of this week um, and then there's you know we'll call them stumbler tools uh, you know after uh, the original grandfather uh, net stumbler uh, that go out and uh, scan the network report back uh, who's on what channel uh, how many users on what channel so my recommendation would be to download one of those Wi-Fi analysis tools, and there's a ton of them out there. Uh, scan and um, see if you know you have a home user that you really can't do that with. Um, you know, for two four, they should be on one six or eleven. Uh, then the three non-overlapping channels, uh, if you, as a general rule. Uh, home Wi-Fi can, you know, sometimes your all your neighbors are on, you know, channels two and four or something dumb like that. But uh, you know, that's that's usually your best choice. 
And on 5 gigahertz, um, if the access point supports it, uh, the Uni 2E uh, channels from, what is it, 100 to 130-something, um, are usually underutilized. Uh, not all access points support them because those have to support DFS, um, but those are frequently underused. Um, and I would really try to stay away from channel 36. Uh, from what I've seen, you know, two-thirds of all the 5 gigahertz systems are on channel 36. So that's probably not a good a good choice choice to start on. Mm -hmm. A question from Rick here: What's the best way to orient the antenna antennas, especially on home routers, vertical or horizontal? Generally vertical. Uh, remember that uh, that those stick antennas, the little dipoles, are going to radiate most strongly perpendicular to the antenna. Uh, so you can try angling them, um, you know, if, if the router is far above or below the user, but generally vertical. Uh, and then I will say with uh, the advent of MIMO, um, we're taking advantage of multipath, of the bounces off of the walls. Uh, and pretty rapidly, uh, things get scrambled up whenever uh, you start bouncing radio waves around. Um, in a lot of cases, I can't tell a difference when I've when I've played with it. Uh, but I'm gonna, you know, start out with vertical, uh, and then play with it. Thank you, Mike. Um, question from Dale here, and I'm sure this is on a lot of folks' minds around uh, six gigahertz. It says, "Is it accurate to say that no antennas available today in consumer devices?" will be capable of operating on six gigahertz band once that comes out. I think that is correct to say. Nothing that's that's generally in the consumer space is going to work in uh, six gigahertz. Thank you. And um, we've got probably time for one or two other questions here, and I, I've got several. And if we don't get to your question today, uh, I'll make sure that uh, that an engineer reaches back out to you and and we um, email the uh, answers to you. Um, question from Brian: um, I work with outdoor products uh, with integrated Wi-Fi capabilities. Do you have a recommended antenna gain for outdoor use that needs to communicate with routers inside consumer homes? Is there a signal strength uh, you'd like to see to prevent drops in communication? The signal strength is is really pretty easy. We have a lot of data on that, um, and it is uh, that you really would like to see about negative sixty five uh, at a minimum. Uh, things begin deteriorating at negative sixty five and uh, by the time you get below about negative 70, things get bad very quickly. Um, and of course, if you're in a high interference environment, uh, you know you may uh, you may need even even more signal than that. Uh, and if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you can probably get by on a little less. But uh, between negative 65 and negative 70, things things begin to deteriorate as far as throughput pretty quickly. On the antenna gain. You know, you want to, the, the natural inclination is to do more gain. Uh, you know, you don't want to waste signal to the sky and to the ground uh, whenever you can be putting it in people's houses. Um, the issue with a lot of high gain antennas is they're physically large. And as I said, that coverage pattern gets very thin. Uh, and it is easier than you would think to have users above or below. Uh, the coverage pattern on those really high gain omnis. Um, so when I was in that space, you know, eight nine dB um, was a pretty good spot I thought for for kind of a high gain omni. Uh, and of course, if you can use a directional antenna or a sector uh, and kind of beam it right at right at the people, that's even better. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm going to try and we'll see how many we can fit in depending on the length of this answer. I, I 
we're already a little bit over time here and I want to be conscious of everyone's time. So I'm going to go with Palmer's question here. Uh, so I apologize. Uh, Ken, uh, Kenya Sola and Daniel and Alan, Miguel, Mark, I'm not going to be able to get to your questions probably. Um, so here's a question from Palmer. Uh, we're using Cisco APs with external antennas in our warehouses. Uh, we do have them mounted, unfortunately, at the top of the ceiling. We arrange our antennas where two are pointed horizontally and two are mounted vertically. Is this okay or wise? I'm assuming that you're probably crossing the uh, the two horizontal antennas so that they're not in the same plane. Um, you know, if you've already got external antennas on there, I would probably look at, instead of Omni's, um, you know, I would probably look at some maybe low gain uh, patches pointing down at the floor, pointing at an angle towards the floor. Um, might be a might be a better solution than than that. Uh, yeah, the. Warehouses are tough because of those those very high ceilings. Um, but yeah, a gain antennas way up in the in the ceiling is probably never going to be a great solution. Um, if you could move them down, you know, I know a lot of times in warehouses that's uh, an issue with uh, equipment running into them. Uh, something that I have seen done quite effectively is uh, move the antenna down uh, if you have to leave the AP up. You can hang uh, antennas from, you know, 10 or 15 feet even of antenna cable. I uh, use good quality antenna cable because uh, power lost in an antenna cable is, is heat and it's it's just lost. So use good quality cables. But uh, if you need to, you can actually hang antennas well below the access point and by putting them on uh, that flexible cable, if a uh, fork truck or something does run, run into them, they just move out of the way. Uh, so I've used that solution pretty effectively in the past. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it there uh, at that uh, question for the last one for the day. Um, tremendous uh, feedback. Uh, and Mike, I'm sure you can see the Q&A pane as well, but uh, a lot of great jobs and this was beneficial and so on. So uh, well done, Great. Mike. Everyone appreciates the presentation today. And with all the questions, maybe this warrants a, a part two and more advanced uh, antenna discussion in a few weeks. So we'll we'll circle back on that. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. If you want to take a product tour, again, every Friday at noon, go to go.7signal.com forward slash tour and get registered, and we'll send you out an invite. Mike, thank you for your time today. Everyone, thanks for coming. Um, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.